little bit further. I also want to show some of the other stuff um, that you could do with this. So um, if you remember last time we set up some preferences, right, inside of your, doo -doo -doo. where are my documents, there we go. Inside your Maya folder, we had that 2016 folder um, that we created, 2016.5. So it's a good idea to back that up every day when you leave, and then when you come in in the morning to restore it. Um, we didn't really change a whole lot of stuff, so right now it's not gonna matter too much. Uh, but as we get on and we start adding our own preferences, we definitely will want to make sure we back those up, okay? So we're just waiting for Maya to open somewhere. It will open so up. Why don't you use the regular piece here? This one? Yeah. Because then, let's bring this. Yeah. All right. So once you have your Maya version open, we simply never, ever, ever, ever just double click our file to open up our project, okay? Like in Cinema, you could do that because Cinema is a primitive program and we've advanced, we've evolved onto better and finer things, okay? So what we have to do is we have to go to open up Maya and then we have to go to file and then we have to set our project, okay? So go to file and then go to set project. And what this will do is it will tell Maya here's the project I'm working on so that when I get into my um, texturing and stuff, it knows where all my stuff is located. So I never ever double click your file and open it because that will just open up Maya and not set your project. They've never figured out a way, I guess, to just like automatically do this, which it should. So we set the project, we click on the project name and then we just say set. Okay, so I'll do that again. So I go to file and I go to set project. I click on the name of the project I'm working on. So mine is Sarcona underscore product. And then I say set. Okay. So what that should do is now when I go to file open, it should automatically drop me into my project folder. Sometimes it doesn't. I know it's kind of glitchy um, in the newer versions. But when I go to open, you can see this time it definitely did drop me right into the scenes folder. Okay. So I'm gonna open up my Pokeball. I've worked on it a little bit since last class. I just want you to see you know, where we're gonna take this. And then I'm basically gonna delete all the stuff that I've done and get us back to where we left off last time. Where is he? Um, Cinema Pokeball into a Maya Pokeball. So you'll see like the edge here isn't very clean. We're not really gonna see that, so it's not a huge deal. But there are other ways that we could model this to make it a little bit cleaner. Um, I don't have that version open. Uh, no. Uh, I have another one somewhere that actually has a cleaner one. But this opening here was done differently. So we cut out that circle right perfectly from that side. The other one that I did, the circle is up top. So just so you can see how um, a different way that this could be modeled. is I drop down the divisions really low. Uh, maybe not that low, maybe 12. Yep, that looks like that. And then I went through and, come on. Oops. I inserted an edge loop like that. And delete all this stuff here. I grabbed this and extruded it in and deleted this piece. Okay, so by doing this, that gives me a nice little round piece like that, so it's nice and even all the way around. But then to create that hole, it took me a good amount of time to kind of shape this. And this isn't the exact way I did it, but to kind of shape this so that that hole looks a lot cleaner and um, smoother, right? So moving these points up like this, tweaking these points in here like that, getting this to look nice and round. So it looks very similar. Okay, so there's other ways to do it. It's just this process takes a lot longer to make it look much better, okay? And because this one's our first you know, transition one, 
I'm fine with just leaving it like that, okay? Uh, but just keep in mind that there are other ways to do that. So I'm going to delete all the stuff that I have here. I'll show this real quick. I should have deleted all of it. Um, lens. Oops. So this is the um, iris. So I've actually kind of set it up so so it could actually work if we wanted to. It's gone now. <laughs> That's gone too. Yep. We'll make it. We'll get through it. Delete the lights. Get rid of that. I'm going to delete all my materials. Okay, nothing in your scene you should ever get really attached to because eventually you want to be able to do this stuff over and over and over again really quick. Gone. going to optimize my scene size which should get rid of everything else that's in there cool. and then I should be able to go back to this assign the default all right so now we're basically back to where you guys left off last time which is we have the top piece and we have this <coughs> bottom piece so um, the next step of this um, we can do a couple things so watch me do mine and then you'll see because um, it's not like you need a walkthrough for you know every piece of this thing. So one of the things I want to do is create obviously the bottom piece. So if I just duplicate this by grabbing both pieces, then I go to my rotate tool and just rotate this around, you'll see that it rotates kind of weird, right? Like one piece is rotating one way and one's going like around there. Just control D, okay? Uh, inside of Maya, um, one object's rotation can be one way, and the other objects can be another way. So that's what's happening is the um, Y rotation for the out the big sphere is going like this. The Y rotation for the other one is going like that. Mm -hmm. So what I have to do is group them. So how do you group stuff like an illustrator? Mm -hmm. Control G, right? Mm -hmm. So we would just hit Control G and then we could rotate it. Okay? And then it's simply a matter of making sure that we rotated it all the way around to 180 and then just kind of like scooting it up. And I did scale it just slightly, just because they're like right on top of each other and that's no good. So just slightly, I gave it a little scale, okay? Then to fill in where this cap is here, I created a cylinder and then I rotated that around to 90. And then I just kind of placed it inside there. So um, duplicate your top rotate it around so you got a bottom and then put a cylinder where the eye area is going to be. All right, so now we have this, but what we need to do is we need to create um, uh, the opening, right? So that we have a lens and stuff inside it. <clears throat> so one thing I want to do is I'm going to extrude this front face here and I'm going to shrink it down and then extrude it and I'm going to push it into that. With all of those little triangles right at the front, I definitely could use that and just leave it the way it is, but it's very difficult to select all those little triangles and make that thing work. So if I go over here to the channel box, there's a poly cylinder one. If I click that and change my caps to zero, you'll see how that goes away. So I only have one face right here, okay? So click on your cylinder, go to the poly cylinder, and then change your caps to zero. Okay, it's going to be way down under the inputs where it says poly cylinder one or whatever the poly cylinder is. So this part is something that we, you know, if you go back to your product assignment, this is pretty much what we did in the product assignment. Um, we're going to grab this face. So if I hold down the right mouse, go to face, remember that? And then we can click right on that face. Now here's something that nobody's asked me yet and I'm surprised. I keep pulling up, pulling up this menu that has a bunch of cool stuff on it. Nobody's asked me how to even get that. This is the best thing about Maya. It's smart in that it knows like everything that I'm doing. So when I click on a, uh, an object, just let me show you. If I shift right click on an object, which brings this menu up, these are all the different things I can do to that object with it selected like that. If I grab the face and do that, it selects stuff just for the face, which is awesome. 
okay? So it takes some getting used to, but instead of like constantly going up here and trying to find the menu, just get in the habit of shift right clicking and then going to, like we're extruding, going to extrude, okay? So what we want to do is we want to offset this in a little bit, just like we did on the Pokemon thing. We're just going to go to offset and maybe put in like 0.1. How thick do you want your lens to be? It's up to you. Obviously not super chunky. Did you extrude yet? No. So you're going to hold down shift, hold down the right mouse button, and then go to extrude face right on the bottom and then you'll get the offset. You want to go like into the surface. Okay? Yeah, well think of it like this. If this is an actual um, device, an actual apparatus, um, the lens and all the uh, controller for everything kind of rotating would probably be like inside of it, right? So I'm assuming that the lens or the um, clicker thing would be in here, the shutter. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to see the black? Because doesn't that mean it's gone over the um, side? It's actually like right on. So no, okay. you don't want to see the black. Yep. Okay, so just a little bit. So go a little bit before the black. And then you can adjust your shape. Like on mine, you can see I can see a little bit of that lip coming through. So I want to maybe pull this up some. Maybe scale it in some. There we go. So you don't want to see any of that lip like popping through my surface. Okay, so some stupid things about Maya. Number one is this key right here. Um, see how tiny my manipulators are? So if you hit the plus sign, that makes them bigger. Usually people hit the minus sign and they end up really small and they're trying to control that. That's horrible to have to do. So that's one stupid thing about Maya. Um, the other thing is the B key. So if you accidentally hit the B key as you select stuff, you'll see this gradation of yellow to orange to red. Okay, that's like a soft select. So if I wanted to create, let's say I had a fancy lens that had some like rounding on it for some reason. I could grab just these vertices, tap B, and it'll allow me to gradually pull these out. Okay, that's obviously way too soft shrink that up a little bit there we go something like that okay so I could do like these little lip type things on there with the soft select but obviously it's not something you want for what we're doing now okay and then once you have this what should the next step be bevel okay bevel the crap out of this thing we only want to bevel the areas that are 90 degrees so anywhere we have um, an edge here, I want to bevel. And because I have edges selected and I shift right click, bevel edge is right there. Boom. How much? Like, oh, it would be the offset or the fraction is the one you want to edit. Okay. 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 And then the segments will add more divisions to it to make it smoother. Okay. So don't forget about these two pieces here. The inside of this, I'm going to undo mine so you can see it. If I hit three on this, this is always a good indicator as to where your bevels are. Okay, so I have nice bevels out here and that holds that shape really crisp, but the inside here, there's no bevel. And then the other side there, there's no bevel. So I hit one again, I go to face, not edge this time. And I grab the two faces and then put a bevel on it. And then this one's gonna be a lot smaller. So my other one was 0.1. Um, this one's going to be 0 0.05. And now when I hit 3, I get a nice little shape.
Yes. So if you just go to the face, and I want to grab that face on the inside, and then actually go inside my object and grab that back face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can do it in either order, but that's the order I did it in. Okay. Because this is a common thing, like <clears throat> there's lots of different parts and pieces that I would build this exact same way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here's another shape, okay? So this is exactly it, except it's just on its own. We grabbed this face here and we extruded it and we adjusted the offset, right? So however thick we want this, that's what we set it to. We extruded it again and pushed it down. Are we supposed to be building this right now? No. This is, I'm just showing you what we just did. Then we're going to go to edge, and we beveled this edge. I adjusted the fraction size. It's too much. There we go. Maybe another segment in here. And then we grabbed the faces there and there, and beveled those too. Okay. So that's the piece that we just built. Okay. Now. That kind of those steps there, we use the bevel, we use the extrude. You'll use those throughout. So everything that we're doing, make sure you understand how to do those as quickly as possible. Um, so that as you work, you can build these things like, you know, no big deal. Oops, opening my calendar. Um, this was pretty much how we did the, um, in the cinema class, how we did the juice class. And it's pretty much like we did the products on our other stuff, right? Like the shampoo and the uh, shaving cream stuff, pretty much the same thing. Cool. All right, so now we want to create a lens, okay? Lens. So I'm going to bring up an image just so we can take a look at this. Um, shutter, fancy. There we go. So this is basically what a shutter looks like, like this, okay? And the way that it functions. <coughs> Uh, to uh, build a shutter. So I'm going to build like one of those pieces. Mm -hmm. So watch me. Don't do it now if you want to. I'm uploading the video to YouTube. You can watch the video and kind of step by step it. Um, just because I know it will take like a while to for everyone to figure that out. So I start off with a plane. Okay. Actually, let's not start with a plane. Let's do it a different way. That's how I started the other one off with. Um, I'm going to go to, um, see how I have nothing selected and I go here, it's like, what do you want to create? Um, I'm going to go to the, the same menu, that shift right click, it just knows everything. Um, I'm going to switch to my front view so I can see this, and I'm going to hit forward to get into wireframe, so we talked about those before. So I'm going to draw one of these uh, uh, items, okay, so I'm just kind of drawing out. what I want that piece to look like. And then I hit enter. Okay, so this one's a little bit chunkier. I'm not gonna spend as much time kind of finessing this one. But the more time you spend doing this, obviously the um, easier it's going to be to, to smooth it out. Is that the three polygons? Correct. What was that? something in cinema. Um, I don't think we've used anything like that in cinema. There's a curve tool in cinema, but this is different than that. Okay, because a curve tool, we have to create something. So with this, um, the way that it works, right, is like I said, there's a little hinge and it rotates the stuff in there. So I'm gonna hit D and move my pivot up here. Okay, so D will move your pivot and then I can put it wherever I want. So now as this thing rotates, it's gonna rotate from this spot, okay? Now, you'll see this kind of comes out like this. That's why we'd have to have this area or this item kind of embedded in the surface because otherwise there's no spot for this really to go. It just kind of like sticks in there. Okay, so now what I need to do is duplicate. Um, I'm actually, I'm just gonna tweak that a little bit. That looks better, okay. Um, I need to duplicate it, but I also need to get this thickness before I do that. So I'm going to extrude it, there we go. And I'm going to just add a little bit of bevel just around these edges. 0.2. Okay. And I'm also going to maybe give this a little bit of rotation, just slightly. If I don't rotate it, what happens is each one is like on top of each other, and that looks weird. Okay. So giving a little rotation gives me a little bit of an offset. All right. So now if I look at this, okay, it's kind of working there. 
Um, actually, I'm not going to rotate it at this point. I'll just leave the rotation off. Okay. So I'm going to um, duplicate it. Now I have to duplicate it around this center point. Okay, so that's like the center of this, so I need to duplicate it. So I could move the pivot back to the center, but then what happens is my pivot is no longer back over there. So I'm going to group it, so I just hit Control G, and that groups it back to itself, okay? So it's basically um, like in After Effects, you have a null. I basically put this thing onto a null. So now I can rotate it like this around the center, but I can also grab the object individually and tweak it that way, okay? So once I have it in a group, I'm just going to duplicate it and then rotate it so many degrees, like, well, let's look at this one, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six of these. So if I have six of those, I have 360 degrees in a circle, right? That's how many degrees go around. So that should be what, 60 degrees for each one. So if I go 60 degrees, I have a big hole. <laughs> so we'll go 30 degrees, perfect. We'll just have double. Now I can hold down shift and hit D. There we go. And that duplicates it with the transform on there. All right, so now I can grab all these pieces. All their pivots are still in alignment. And I totally missed the center of that. Let me just go back to this. I'm just going to grab my points. And just scale those in towards the center. There we go. All right, there we go. Perfect. All right, so now I would have a shutter, and then I could just take this whole uh, group and just stick it inside the body like that. Obviously, make sure it's centered. Doesn't look like it's centered. There we go. Okay. Now, if I needed to, I could also grab the vertices of this and just shove these really far back. Right? There's nothing back here, so I can just shove that as far back as I need to, just to make sure I have room for all of this stuff. Why aren't you grabbing my group? Uh, window outliner. So now if I go into here and I grab this, and this is why it's kind of difficult to use because you have to keep selecting it this way. In the animation class, you'll see how we can rig something like this. All right, pretty cool. All right, so if you want to add something like that, you definitely could. Um, you don't even see it, like if I went back to my nuke one, that's it right there. <laughs> it's just a black circle, okay? Um, so you could obviously like play with it. All right. So the uh, next thing we want to do is we want to um, put in a lens and we want to put in um, an image or an image of what this would look like. Okay. So if you don't have that already, like I modeled it, so I have it. If you don't have that, obviously you want to put something there so it looks like there's something between the lens and the other objects. Okay. Um, on the desktop here, here, 2520 resources, Pokeball. On this Pokeball, they basically just have this area and they have just like this like glowing orb behind it. And then in the other one here, they have like a blue one, but they have a little bit more modeling involved there. So there's lots of different things you can actually do depending on how involved you want to get with yours, okay? So, so far, all we've done is create the cavity for it what we put inside the cavity is up to us, okay? That sounded weird. Um, so I'm going to just do the simplest one first, and then you'll see how we can um, make it a little bit more fancy. So here's the simplest version of this, is we take a sphere, I rotate it 90 degrees, I delete like half of this, like that, and then I just kind of flatten it out. And then I just do this. Okay? You don't have to make the shutter lens, right? This is just like one option of what you can 
add to this just to make it look like it's completed. Okay, so this is just simply a piece of glass on the end of it, just a super simple um, thing there. And then for the actual like lens stuff that you would have, like this, I would just take that same thing and just duplicate it, push it back, and then just flatten it out. That way when we get into the texturing part, I can basically just assign a material right to that one that has a picture of a lens, and then it would just look like a lens in there, okay? So that's one way that we could do this. All right, so I'm just gonna throw this onto a layer here. Um, to play with the layers, you grab your stuff, you just click the add new layer button, and then you can add stuff to your layer, and then you can hide it. Much simpler than um, cinema stuff. Um, chest one. Cool. All right, so that's test one of something you could add to that. Let's say we wanted to go a little bit more involved and create something like this. Again, that's definitely doable because it's just another piece of geometry. So we can create another sphere, pull this out, rotate it 90 degrees, and then we can just go bananas on this thing. Like, grab this, grab that, I'm going to extrude it, just push that in, that's kind of cool. Uh, maybe I'll grab this stuff here. Oops, I need to get inside. I want to push this in further, right? Because that's where the eye would be. I could add some bevels to this to make it look nice. There we go. So now we have this kind of inside it, and then if I were to take that piece of glass and put that in front of it, that could look really cool too, like we actually have like a little camera inside of the lens area, or a camera inside the eye area, or whatever that is. Um, these little, like, little lights that are around it, we could do something like that too. If I just created a, uh, this is the simplest way to create something like a sphere, like a, if I take a cube and hit three, there's a sphere, <laughs> and there's like not many divisions to it. So I'm going to take this and use the same trick that I used on that shutter area. So I'm just going to reset my translate here. And I'm just going to move this to where I want this to be. So let's say right there-ish. That's cool right there. All right. OK, so now it's like right there on the side. So now I'm going to group it to itself. That just puts the pivot here, and then I can duplicate this, and then rotate it, let's say 10 degrees, and then use Shift D a bunch of times. Okay, and now we have this nice little like looping thing that goes all the way around, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so that's again another option that we could have inside there. Uh, this one looks like, I think that's the same one, yeah, it's the same one. There is. Uh, for something like this, again, we could do something very similar to that. That's actually like we have out here, right? So it just comes out here, then goes in, and then there's a lens. So their lens would just be a little sphere that sticks out. Right there. Okay. And I always delete the stuff that I don't need. So I don't need the back piece of this. So I always go through and just grab the stuff I don't need and delete it. And then I can just shrink that down. OK. And then I can even push this in. If I don't like it out that much, I can just kind of push that in, grab all this stuff, push that in. OK. So there's lots of different options that you could do for this kind of thing. Now what I want to do is um, those two items, the lens and the other area, are typically things that we don't need to play around with too much, okay? Uh, but what I do want to do is show how we could then take this stuff, um, these main pieces here, let me grab all this stuff that I have there and just throw this on a layer and hide it. Okay, so all this stuff here, I want to show how we could then go ahead and paint these items, okay? 
So what we have to do is we have to do what's called UV layout. So if you remember your product one where we had the cereal box or we had the cans, whatever it was, we had to get a texture that we could apply to it, okay? Very similar to that. So um, grab all of your items in your scene, okay? And I want you to go to lighting and shading and assign a favorite material surface shader. Grab everything in your scene. Mm -hmm. Hold down the space bar, remember that? Oh, yeah. And then go to lighting and shading, assign favorite surface shader. Okay? So this is assigning a material to our object. Okay? Now it should open up the attribute editor. Um, the channel box is kind of like bullet points. This is like the top things you would typically play with. The attribute editor has like a thousand things extra inside of it, okay? Even more stuff um, than you typically would play with. So under my surface shader, I'm just gonna make sure that my stuff is not on the default, there we go. Uh, under the surface shader tab, um, it allows us to pick a color, okay? So if I go with black, he's black. If I go with white, he's like white, okay? Um, we also have on the far right side, we have these checkerboards. Anytime we see a checkerboard inside Maya, that means that we can assign a different item to it. So if we want to put a picture of a dog here, that's where we will put the picture of a dog, okay? Now in this case, uh, if you remember back in cinema or back in the intro class, we assigned a checkerboard to our stuff to help us with the alignment to make sure everything was square. We want to do the same thing here. So we're going to click on the checkerboard on the out color That'll bring up a new window, and then we'll pick on checkerboard. Okay, so click on the checkerboard on the far right, and then it brings up a window, and then you click on checkerboard from there. On your hotkey sheet, there was a button that we could click that would show textures. Yes, sir. Six? Correct. So if we hit six, we will be able to see the texture. Okay. Now for most of these, they're probably gonna look pretty horrible. The idea with anything that we do when we do our texture stuff is that we want these um, checkerboards to look uniform, to look square across the entire thing. Now there may be spots where it's square, but it might be cut in half or something, and that's fine as long as they're all square, all right? So this checker pattern right here is very, very, um, not a lot of checkers. We need a lot of checkers, okay? So if you notice, there's another tab that says place 2D texture. That's how the item is getting placed. So in cinema, we would go to the thing up there and we would specify how many repeats we want. This is like across the board how many repeats we have. So we click on this place 2D texture tab. Then we go down to repeats and we put in like 50-50. Okay. So go to where it says repeat UV and type in 50-50. From here, you'll get an idea of actually how uniform these squares are, okay? So what we need to do is a couple things. In the um, product one, we had one major product that we were basically laying out the texture for, and so it wasn't like a whole lot of different items. Here, we have several items. We have, let me just switch this. This item, this item, this item, that item, and this that are all different items that we need to adjust. Um, also inside here, uh, let me just duplicate this so you can see it better. Look at what happens when I hit one and three on this one. So do you see how it changes? So depending on what we want, um, as far as like the end look, we have to make sure that our stuff is, before we go to the next step, is the way we want it to look, okay? So for, um, this item, I'm gonna hit four just so I don't blind myself, holy cow, or five. Uh, on this item, I'm gonna to go to mesh and say smooth, because I know that my end result, I want it to be smooth. And if I don't smooth it out, it's gonna look funky when I put a texture on it, okay? My sphere, oops, um, the same thing, right? So I may want to add a smooth to that too. So I'm basically gonna grab everything in my scene and just do a one level of smoothing to it. So I just go to mesh and I say smooth. Under the modeling menu it says mesh 
and then smooth. Now you could also use the hot box, that space bar thing. Okay, so just grab everything and go to mesh smooth and that will get so you a smooth. Like smooth yes. You don't need to add any more divisions to it. Uh, mesh and then smooth. Yep. Okay. And then if you look at the shape that I have here, if I go one and three, there's still a difference, but the idea with this is that I've already smoothed it, so I don't even need to hit three anymore. That's the idea with it, okay? So we don't need to worry about that. Now, with all of these different shapes on here, um, they all have to be basically laid out so that, like, what would they look like if they were flat? How would we cut these objects? We also have on each one of these objects, let me just grab this one to show, um, we have an inside and an outside. So at some point we may want like the inside and outside to look completely different. On one of our assignments, uh, we'll be doing an item where we see both sides and we don't want them to look the same. We may want the inside to be like black and the outside to be blue or whatever, okay? So we have to lay out each one of these pieces. Um, Cinema is actually pretty horrible for UV layout. Maya is pretty nice, especially with the workflow we're gonna be taking this into. There's only a few things we have to do. So watch me do, uh, you're gonna see me do my entire UV layout on mine, and then you can do yours, okay? So under UV, there's this thing called the UV editor. So if you remember from cinema, this was something that we used before. I'm blinded, I'm gonna go to uh, image and turn my image off so I don't see that, holy cow. Um, I, I don't know what I have to push, but mine doesn't look like that. What, this? Yeah, the, um, yeah, math and math is like really crazy. That's fine. We'll tweak it once we get to it. Okay. So what I need to do is, um, this is typically what yours would look like. Let me just adjust mine. Okay. You typically have like everything like kind of like bunched up all into one area here. And so what I need to do is I need to lay out the UVs for each piece. I need to basically tell Maya, go through and cut this thing out so that every single area is nice and smooth. So I'm gonna go under UV and say automatic, okay? Anytime you see a uh, box on the right, those are options. So before you go into that tool, definitely check out the options and just see if there's something there that maybe you need to tweak. So I'm gonna say project. And what it does is it automatically cuts that into several pieces. So now this should be pretty much uniformly square. If I grab the bottom piece and do the same thing, UV automatic, it does the same thing. If I grab this and go to UV automatic, it does the same thing. If I grab this piece here and go to uh, UV automatic, uh, this one did not do a good job. If you look at the shape of these, what's happening is it's projecting. Anything that's facing sideways, it projects it this way. Anything that's facing up and down, it projects it that way. Anything that's facing front to back, it projects it that way. So what happens is because these pieces are like super thin, it doesn't uh, project them square. So you see how tiny these areas are here? And if I were to zoom in, that was a little faster zooming in, there we go. Um, you can see how we got rectangles here and not squares. It's because this area, these things are not square. So I need to find the little scale square and scale it up. And as I do that, what it's going to do is give us a more uniform looking UV layout. So now if I zoom in here, too far, there we go. You can see how square these pieces look. Okay, so I'll do the same thing to this one. I'll go to UV. I'll say automatic, it'll give me those squares, and then I will stretch it out. Whoopsie. There we go, there we go. Yep, so that's everything, okay? So now all of my pieces are laid out correctly, 
Okay, so now open your UV editor. You can turn the image off and then grab each piece one at a time and do the automatic mapping. And make sure you have squares. All right, so now if we were to look at all of our shapes together as one UV map, they would look like a huge mess, okay? Because basically um, we've taken each piece and cut it and flattened it out, and that's what it would look like, but then each piece is stacked on top of itself. If we were going to paint each piece individually, this wouldn't be a problem. But ideally, we want to be able to paint all of this in one shot, right? I don't want to have to go into um, Mari with each one of these pieces separately and paint them separately because at some point I may want to come in here and say maybe paint a little texture that goes between several of the surfaces, right? Something like that. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to then offset each one of our surfaces. So you've gone to UV and it looks like everyone has their UV editor up. Um, so under uh, view, there it is, grid, go to your option box for grid. Okay, so go to view, grid, option box for grid. This is going to allow us to basically create more tiles. You don't need the tile visibility there, but it definitely helps out tremendously when you see it. Okay, so we want the length and the width to be three. So type your length and width to be three. You want subdivisions two. Wait, what's going on? I'm still messing what's going on? Yeah, I'm still messing with the mapping on there. Okay, so you want it to say axes, grid lines, and subdivision lines are off, and tile lines are on. Okay. So the first one and the last one are checked. The middle two are not checked. And then you can hit apply and close. Oops. Nope. There we go. All right, so now what that does, if we were to zoom out, is that now we should see this like extra grid pattern that wasn't here before. Before it was only showing us this one grid area. So when we bring in a file, okay, so like on our product one, we took that snapshot, that square, we brought that into Photoshop, we painted our texture of what we wanted it to look like. How you doing, Jeff? What's going on? And then we brought that out of Photoshop and back in and it drops right in place, okay? Because we want to basically paint multiple pieces at the same time, we want to create multiple files for each one, okay, or one file for each one, okay? So what we have to do is take our arrangement and then move them into different areas so that they're all nice and neat. So uh, watch me again and then you can do it to yours. So I'm going to click on one piece, it doesn't matter which one. Um, actually, I'm going to try to do this. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I'm going to grab everything and do a layout, and then I'm going to say um, 4096, translate shells, uh, tile it 3 and 3, and then layout. We'll see if this works. Again, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. Otherwise, I'll just manually move them, which is no big deal. The nice thing about doing this when it does work is that it, it does stack things nicer together. I'm going to undo it. I realize why I didn't want to do this. <laughs> because it doesn't group them nicely the way I wanted them to be grouped. I don't have to wait. Nobody, nobody tells me what to do. <laughs> I'm going to hit escape. There it goes. So you can see that it does like place them separately in here, which is like a nice little feature. Uh, but the problem is when we get into Mari, um, what's going to happen is that the items aren't grouped together so that when I want to select an individual item I can't do that because Mari is saying nope that's part of this grouping here okay so I'm gonna grab one item I'm gonna come over here to um, you may have to expand this sometimes this is like shrunk down um, I'm gonna go over here to where this would say point one and I just change it to one and then I can scoot this whole shell over Oops. right click go to shell grab everything and then scoot that over to one, okay? So I know that my first piece is over to the right. Then I'm gonna go down to my second piece, let's say it's this piece. I'm gonna grab the shell, grab it, <clears throat> and then scoot it over one, two. 
That way it's not right on top of it. Then I'm going to grab another piece. Say this piece. I'll grab this. I'll scoot it up one. And actually, I'll scoot it over one also. Yes, ma'am. Mine's going in very small increments. Because yours is point 0.1, not 1, right? So if you typed in 1 there, oh, okay. then you could change that. Okay? I'm sorry. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So I didn't, I moved all of them except for one of them. So this bottom piece here, I don't have to move every piece. I just need to make sure they're not all on top of each other. That's the idea. So now if I grab everything, you can see nothing is overlapping. Everything is kind of like in their own area. Okay, so each one of these pieces is a separate area. So this is one of my chunks. This is one of my chunks. This is one of my chunks. These two are different chunks. Uh, this is actually the lens. This is the top ribbon that goes around. This is the bottom ribbon that goes around. This is my top shell. This is my bottom shell. You don't need to know what they are, but just for fun, for trivia tonight, okay? So now take each one of your pieces and move it to a different area of the shell. That way everything is nicely separated like this. All right, so if we have all these things laid out, if you don't have it, don't worry about it. You know, you can, um, and anything that I ever lecture up here, if I get too far ahead and you're like, okay, you're like 10 steps ahead of me, don't worry, just take notes. You can watch the video after, catch up um, after class or in lab or whatever, okay? So don't worry about always staying in beat with me. Um, so now that everything's kind of laid out, what we're gonna do is we need to export this out into another package called Mari. And in Mari, we can actually go through and paint stuff, okay? Mari is another huge program. It's like ginormous. We're gonna touch on just a few things today just to get used to how the software works. Um, it's a, once you get through the this program sucks phase, it's actually a pretty awesome program. And if you want your stuff to look awesome, this is how we get it, right? The intro class is the intro class for a reason. It's basically, let's get our feet wet, let's understand how 3D works, let's understand how to do some basic texture stuff. This class is, let's make it look 10 times better, right? We want something like even this guy here, here, he looks like crap because I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time doing it because I know when I get to class, I'm gonna do it again. And then on the weekend, I'm gonna do it again because I'm gonna do this thing like 10 times, okay? Because there's a lot that, goes into doing each one of these steps. Okay, if you look at something like this one, or like that one, there's a lot of work that goes into making this look the way it looks, okay? It's not, um, Mike Crum has this great thing, he always says it's not plop plop Photoshop, right? You don't just drag and drop stuff in there and it just works. There's actually a lot of work that goes into this and that's why people make lots of money doing 3D stuff because it is so technically involved, okay? but it's nothing that we can't learn. It's simply a matter of just getting through all the crap and getting through the process of understanding it. Cool. All right, so um, all the stuff we've done to this guy, uh, every single piece that we created, we deleted stuff, we laid out the UVs, we beveled it, we extruded stuff. Um, everything has its history, right? So remember we talked last time about history and how Maya saves all the stuff that we're doing over here in the channel box, here's all that stuff. If I click on this, even this uh, lens area, here's all the stuff that we did from it, right from creating a cylinder. I need to grab this and delete the history. Delete by type, history, okay? So that's something you could do really quick. Just grab all your stuff. Doesn't even matter where you're at because you can delete it and then just add stuff to it and delete your history, okay? So edit, delete by type, history, and then it's gone. Um, just to get rid of all the extra junk there uh, because we don't want anything to cause any issues. So we talked at the beginning of class a little bit about going between different versions. Um, if you're working on Maya 2015 at home, let's say we use some crazy function of 2016 extension 2 and you try to take that home, it's not going to work because that function in 2016 extension 2 isn't in 2015. But if we delete history, well now you can bring it in there. It's kind of like you don't have a font so you rasterize the type and then you can see it, that's what we're doing, okay? So once I have this, then I can export this out into Mari. So um, window, I'm gonna show this, you probably don't need to go this way, but I'll show it anyway. Uh, settings, preferences, plugin manager. 
if you don't have this OBJ exporter loaded, you would go to uh, Settings Preferences Plugin Manager and load the OBJ export. It should be loaded. For some reason, it's not. It's there. So you're just going to go to File and export your selection. So I'm going to export this out as Pokeball oops, 001 and make sure I'm choosed on OBJ export. Okay, so I've chosen OBJ export from the file export selection box. Okay, so I grabbed the Pokeball, I went to file, I went to export selection, I export this out as a Pokeball OBJ. Okay, and the reason I'm choosing OBJ is because Mari reads OBJ files. Mari doesn't read Maya files. Okay. Um, several different 3D programs read OBJ, like everyone reads OBJs. That's very universal. Okay, so now we've exported it. Now, on your computer, these computers have an issue running Mari when any other program is running. So you have to shut down your program. So you probably want to save it and then shut it down. I'm also going to close Nuke in my viewer, and that, and that. All right, so I've shut down all my stuff. Now I can find Mari, and if you look, there's like a bunch of different versions. You just want the regular Mari 3.1 or whatever it is. Um, I said I would talk about how to get Mari. If you go to Foundry, C-O-U-K, Go to their products, Mari, and then you're going to get the free 30-day trial. So when you click on that, it'll say register for your stuff, you know, type in your information, and then it'll provide you a link that you'll download. You'll install Mari, and then it'll come up with a, um, how do you want to license this thing? And then you'll type in that code from the first day handout, okay? Once you type in that code, it'll say, do you have a Flex LM or an RLM license? We have RLM. It doesn't matter if you try one, it doesn't work, you can try the other one and it will work. Okay? Yep, you go to the free trial and then you type in your stuff. And then it'll give you a link to download. You did something else. I think you just registered for the newsletter. But you do the same thing for um, Nuke. You go here. I think there's a 15, oh, the 30 day trial. They upgraded it. Okay, you want the free 30 day trial and you could download that. We don't want that one. That's a different thing. Okay. okay. So now inside of Mari. Okay, the interface is pretty horrible. If you don't want to use Mari and you want to play around with something like Mudbox, uh, Mudbox is actually pretty user friendly going back and forth between Maya. Um, but it's more of like sculpting and painting. And I'm not totally familiar with Mudbox because I just use Mari. So if you wanted to play with that, you definitely could try it out. Okay. Um, some people really like it, especially because you can download it for free and have it on your home computer for three years and not have to worry about a license. Give it a go. So I'm going to go to new on the bottom left. Okay. So you're going to click on new on the bottom left and we're going to give this a name. So I'm going to call this Sarcona underscore Pokeball. For the path, we have to specify where our piece of geometry is. So I'm going to click on the... Um, up arrow and I'm going to go find my piece of geometry. It's not on the G drive. What am I doing? 25, 20, there we go. Okay, so you're going to find your OBJ and then just load that into that area. Um, for the root path, you want to click the arrow there and direct it to your source images folder. Okay? So I click on that root path, which is under texture. And I just want to make sure it's set to my P drive, my 2520, Sarcona product, source images, choose. Okay? So now what this should do is it should bring in our piece of geometry and allow us to paint it. So from these areas down here, it's asking us, what do you want to paint? So for something like 
I closed it. <laughs> Let me just open it back up again. For something like even this, um, there's an area that's basically color information. Okay, so what does the color information of this look like? Um, there are some green spots here, some um, brown spots, some orange spots you can see really close. So that would be like the color information. Um, stuff like the specular information could be stuff like the scratches. Okay, so if you didn't want your glossiness or the reflection to look nice and smooth, we could scratch it up. Um, we have some bump areas, so stuff like this could be part of the bump. And the same thing here, you can see the color of this is kind of like a blue. And then we have some bump areas that are kind of like scratches and stuff. And then we also have some areas where there's text. And that's also done in um, the texture itself, okay? Where's the Pokeball? There he is. Come on. So in here again, we have color information. We also have some specular information. So you can see this highlight isn't perfect. It's like scuffed up. And then we have some splotches and some scratches. So most of the time you're gonna start off with um, just the color information. And then based on the color information, we'll build from there, okay? So I'm gonna hit color, create. For the size, I'm gonna pick 4096, okay? So this means that for every single one of those squares that we had, we're gonna create a 4K image. That's a lot of information for Maya to handle, uh, but it does a pretty decent job of it. Then I'm gonna hit okay. Okay, so it's loading, it's thinking. Um, in seven years, it'll open up, there we go. Okay, so this is the um, interface for Mari. Now on yours, you have just your lens. So that means you had just the lens clicked when you exported it. So you just go back to Maya, export out the entire thing, and then bring it back in, okay? Uh, just export selection, but make sure everything's selected. Okay, so the navigation is the same as Maya, right? Which definitely helps out. So Alt, left clicking and dragging, middle clicking and dragging, and then right clicking and dragging. Okay, so those are all the same. The sucky thing is that their cameras don't operate the same, so sometimes you get to this like weird spot like this, and you just want to like rotate it back so that it's not like that. And that could be a little bit tricky sometimes um, to get it there. Luckily, the one, two, three, four, five, and six allow us to jump to different cameras, which help us kind of reset ourselves, okay? Now, here's where this gets a little bit tricky. Um, over here on the top right, is where we're basically gonna be doing a lot of our um, painting set, painting steps, like where we're gonna be getting um, the brushes and stuff like that. Down here on the bottom is where we're gonna be doing layers and controlling how our brushes work. Um, and then over here are our tools. We typically only use a few tools in this, in this program. Um, so here's our color channel. So that's all the color information. Like I said, you could have multiple channels, so you could have like a dirt mask and a specular and whatever else. Uh, we also have an image manager. Um, we also have shaders, which we'll get into later. And then we also have the shelf, which is where you're probably going to spend a lot of time picking out different kinds of brushes. So these are all default brushes that come in with the software. So just to show you, if I went to this um, veiny one and I just click on here, you can see how now I have this like veiny print right on the ball. Okay, it's so like I'm just painting the texture right on it. Uh, if I click here again, there's another one. You'll see it's a little bit different because each time I paint, it's actually giving me a little bit of randomness in there too, okay, which is pretty nice. If I click and drag, you'll even see I get a bunch of little veiny things on there for some reason. Okay, so this is just different ways that we can paint with different brushes. All of these are just like stuff from Photoshop. Okay, so just like a Photoshop brush, you could bring in different brushes, you could download brushes, whatever. Okay, there's Brad's new brushes right here too, so you can do, like the one had a thumbprint, I think there's even like a fingerprint inside here. That's not it, but imagine that it was, that'd be awesome, right? <laughs> All of these are different brushes. Yep, just to give us a different look to how we want this thing. Um, there it is, there's a fingerprint, okay. 
All right. So those are all the different brushes. Now, um, oops, what did I click? Um, we want to be able to control things on different layers. We want to be able to paint things um, exactly how we think they should be painted. So the first thing I want to do is go through and just give each area or each object its own color. Okay. So like in this one. Uh, the top of this is red and the bottom of this is white and the lens area is black and then this area is kind of like a silver So that's what I'm going to do first I'm going to basically lay down just like a default color on the whole thing and then I'm going to start layering up into different areas So I'm going to go over here on the very far left There is color information. So I'm going to click on that I'm going to double click on that there it is and I'm going to pick a color. So let's say I picked red, okay? And that should be no big surprise. This is like where your stuff is like in every program like Photoshop or Illustrator on the bottom left. I'm going to pick a regular brush cuz I don't need this crazy brush. And then I'm going to change my um, size of this. So if I look here, here's all the like I'm on the paintbrush, that's the default one. And there's my hotkeys, radius, rotate, opacity, and squish. So if I hold down R and I click and drag to the right, it makes my brush bigger. So then I can go ahead and paint this. Actually, I have something else on, hold on. There we go. So now I can paint this whole thing red. Now I don't want the whole thing to be red, I only want that top piece to be red, okay? So that's where this arrow comes in. The arrow allows us to select items. So if I just click on that top piece, I basically selected, like that's what I want to paint. And then I'm gonna go over here to my projection and say project on the front, project on selected only. Okay, now I go back to my brush and now when I go and paint, it only paints on that one object. Now you'll see there's a, tiny bit of a delay like I hit the alt key and you'll see the hourglass pops up and then I can rotate okay so what's happening is every time I hit alt it's saving that information out okay so now let me grab a different piece so I'm gonna grab this click the bottom click back on my brush pick a different color I'm gonna grab blue for the bottom color And now I'm going to paint this. Okay, so every time I do that, it's writing out all of those textures. So anything that's changed, it saves it out. So this is also another reason that we don't want to have too many um, objects on different textures, because it'll actually have to write out each one of those objects, each one of those textures. Okay, now I'll grab my arrow again, click on another piece, click my color. back to my brush <clears throat> now this is kind of hard to paint this one because it's very difficult to get all the pieces as I spin around I'm kind of missing some spots now here's where um, this is really awesome is that I can actually go to the UVs and I can see the UVs I painting and I could just paint them right there okay so I know that I want that lens area to be all black those are the lens UVs I can just paint it all black and I hit alt and it locks it in okay then I can go to this and I know that this piece here and this piece here oops I want to be like a grayish color so I'm gonna actually bring it up to like that go back to my brush there we go. And you can also see that I've missed the other pieces, right? Like the red is not red here in, on all those pieces. So I grab this again, click that again. Oops. I didn't hit Alt before I clicked off. Let me click back on this. And then let me go back to my brush. There we go. Hit Alt. There we go. Now I can click back on here, click back on this. Re grab my red. There we go. And I'll grab 
of the blue, I'll use my eyedropper, then grab my brush, then paint it all, then hit alt. Okay, so now that gives me my base coat over the entire thing. Okay, so very easily I could um, go through and change those colors. Now I have my red, white, and blue Pokeball. Now I want to add more detail to this. Okay, so that's where the layers come in. So you're familiar with Photoshop and Illustrator, so you're familiar with how layers work. Add a layer on top, and then we can paint stuff on top of that and do stacking. So I'm going to add a new layer right here. And I'm going to call this metal. Okay. Now I want to paint metal basically on top of this coloration. If I use the brushes here, I can paint scuffs and scratches. And there's the one that's called oil, yeah, oil dripping. Um, okay. If I go into here, um, yeah, it's going to paint blue right now. So if I go in here and I paint the or change this color to, there we go, let's say gray like that, and I click, there you go. So you can kind of see how it's kind of like a grayish color on top of it, but it's not very realistic. It actually looks like, it's like a fake material. What I want to do is actually find a good picture of metal and actually put that picture of metal right on top of this. So this is where it gets awesome, uh, if you're not already blown away. <laughs> so I need to go find a picture of metal. Um, in the intro class, you use textures.com. Same thing here. You want to grab the um, textures.com, find some good materials. And then, like, I think this is a good one. No, not that one. That's a good one there. Okay, so I'm going to go to this metal painted, and I'm going to change this to my image manager and just drop in that metal. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I just drop the metal right into here, and just like Photoshop, I can clone stamp essentially right on top of it. So I drag this into my scene and now I'm projecting that texture straight onto my object. Okay. So once I do that, I'm in a different tool, which is this one. I have different options, which are these. So I'm going to shrink this down. Maybe zoom in a little bit too. Make my brush a little bit bigger. And now I'm painting that on there. Now that's probably a little bit too harsh, right? Because now I'm getting rid of the red. So I'm gonna hit undo. I can change, just like Photoshop, I can change my layer mode. So instead of painting full blown color, I'm painting like, let's say, multiplying. So now you can see how I'm painting this and I'm getting like the red pieces kind of chipping through. Let me hit undo again. Um, I can actually paint this and then go over here and change this and see different results. So if I want to play around and see, switch brushes real quick, see what these different results are, I can see if there's one that matches what I want it to look like. Okay, I actually saw one that I liked. I'm going to jump back up to that one in a minute. This one here. So that one's pretty cool there. Um, yeah, add is a little bit too much, multiply is a little bit too much. Oh, lighten, look at that, that looks nice. Okay, now I can take this opacity down too, so I don't have to use it at the full opacity. So now that I have that in there and it's looking sweet, then I can jump back to this and then start painting some more scuffs and scratches on here. And you can see how as I paint this, it's actually going across all those surfaces. And now to move that, I just hold shift and just scoot the brush over. And now I can paint this up here. Otherwise, I'm going to get a seam. Eventually, wherever the edge is, you'll see a seam right there. So I just move it over, and I can just paint. And now it's gone. OK? And then when I hit Alt, that locks it in. Until I hit Alt, it's not locked in, and I can do some other adjustments. So now you see that I have these like little scuffy marks on top of that. OK? Now that's pretty sweet. Um, it's not really updating though. If you look at this, um, I mean the color is there, but the specularity isn't. It still looks nice and smooth. Um, this is where I can go to my shader, and I'm going to add a new shader under this. So I'm going to say, uh, I'll just use a Beckman for now. And I'm just going to say that for my bump, I want to use my color channel. 
And then for my specular roughness, I'll also use my color channel. Okay. So now what this gives me is a little bit more variation in these um, spots here. Might be a little bit hard to see with this one just because it's red with this white. But it definitely feels a little bit different. Okay. Uh, let me make a new layer just so we can see it. And I'll really like go crazy with this. Let me just make this black. Okay, and this is stuff that's just on top of that other layer. I haven't touched the other layer. So now that I've done that, now look at it. How gorgeous that is. Right, it feels like it has a texture, right? It, it's not like super smooth, it's just like, hey, you got something going on there. And we can scuff this up even more. And really get some nice detail on top of that metal texture. Okay, so you can see why this process can take a long time because I can't do this, like there's no way to just say fill the entire thing. I have to go around and do each area separately. Okay, so I drag this back in here and I go through, let me turn my layer off and just go back to my metal. And I'm just going through and just kind of painting this stuff in, making sure it doesn't look like there's a pattern here. And you want to do this kind of, you know, just like I'm doing it, a little bit at a time. And I'm zoomed in pretty close. You don't want to be zoomed out. If you're zoomed out, you'll actually not be able to get all the detail. So I basically lock myself to one zoom. Okay? So all I'm doing is just rotating and moving the camera. I'm not zooming in and out. And I'm pushing this in here to get it lined up. Okay? So I don't do this because when I do this and I start painting, Okay, look at the whole ball has that texture on it. I hit Alt. Now I'm going to zoom in. It's going to take a little bit. There we go. Look at how ugly that is now. Do you see how grainy it is? Because we were so far zoomed out, it takes that image and just stretches it across all those textures. Once I'm zoomed in and I start painting this, look at how fine that detail is. Okay? So it's simply a matter of how, um, how good do you want your stuff to look. If you want it to look good, you're going to spend time making it look good. Uh, otherwise, it's going to look like junk. I mean, you can definitely tell a huge difference in this area here compared to the rest of it. Now, the other thing that I want to show, let me bring in another image that's a little bit more obvious. So maybe this one. And drop this on. Okay. So let's say that I wanted this uh, rusty texture here. So I go to the top of the ball and I'm painting this rusty texture. Let me just make it a new layer. We don't have to see this other stuff. There we go. So I'm painting this right on top of here. Now from this angle, that looks pretty good. There we go. And just for fun, we'll just go up here and just do that. Okay, so that looks pretty good from that angle. Now when I hit Alt though, when I start to spin around, you're gonna see how horrible this is gonna look once it starts spinning around. There we go. Okay. Look at what it did to the sides of this. It like streaked the sides. Okay. So remember how we did the automatic mapping and it projects it in all those directions? What this tool does is it actually makes a little projection every time we paint. So when we're up here above it and we're painting this, it's basically projecting that texture straight down and that causes it to streak. Okay. So I can't just project everything like from one view. It just doesn't work. You'll get streaking. Um, there are some tools under projection here that will control that. If I turn on my mask and I go to my edge mask and turn this on, what this does is it creates basically a feathering so that as we paint and it gets close to those edges, it won't streak because it just won't paint in those areas. So as I go in here and I just start oops, painting, uh, let me clear my layer. I'll just delete the layer, remove layer, make a new one. There we go. So as I start painting this, you'll see that it's not going to allow me to paint right along the borders because it's preventing me from streaking it along there. So that way that I know that that area needs to be painted so that when I come around here, now I can start to fill in that data with this. OK? 
Okay, and then I'll start to roll around the ball a little bit more and start to paint this a little bit more on here. Okay, now these are not lining up. Obviously, there's grid patterns on this one. I'd want those grid patterns to line up so it looks correct. And you can see even just that uh, change in there, uh, we definitely get a nice little neat effect where we have this glossiness on top of that red. And it's like super bright, and then it's like really dull. Okay. So a lot of times you'll use uh, Mari in these stages just to make your stuff look like 10 times better. And inside that projection, there's other options inside here too. Like one of them is this fractal noise. And that's what I'll use to add just some scuff marks to this. So if I go to my shelf, I go to this brush. This is an awesome brush. It creates basically a mask. So you see where it's all pink? That's where this mask exists. So we can't paint on the pink areas but I can paint in these uh, see-through areas. So my brush is on black, I'll make it a bit bigger. So you can see how I'm painting this here. It's only painting in that area. And so that when I turn my mask off, you can see how we got this kind of like splotchy pattern on top of that. Instead of, if this wasn't on there, it would look like solid black. And that obviously wouldn't look very realistic. Uh, we could also take our opacity down too, right? So that's obviously uh, an option. But again, it's not, it's a inconsistent color and it looks kind of splotchy. Having that fractal noise on there allows us to uh, create a much more nicer look. Okay. So before next class, um, try to have all of your modeling done, the UV layout done, and this guy exported and at least play around with Mari just a little bit, okay? I'm not saying finish it up. I'm saying play around with Mari to the point where uh, when you get into the program, you know where the brushes are, you know how to drop stuff on there. Um, the only other thing you need to know is how to save your stuff in here because this is a little bit different than everything else, of course. Um, once you're done, you go to your project, you click on your project here, and then you say archive. Oops, I have to close it first. So I have to go to File, Close Project. There we go. And then I would go to Archive, and then I would save that archived file to my P drive. Okay. And then when I load my file, I go to Open Archive. Because what happens is it saves all these temporary files along with your scene file. So then next time I would go to Open Archive, but right now it's saving it still. I would say open archive, I would find that file, and then I'd be able to open it up, okay? So if you don't do that, all the painting you just did is gone, okay? So make sure you've archived it when you're done painting, and then you can go and open the archive and load everything else back up. And you'll see that file is pretty huge. Uh, mine, oops, it said it was 600 megabytes. 25, 20. There it is. Yeah, 700 megabytes. Uh, because each one of those images is saved inside this, it's going to be a huge file. Okay. And now it's opening it, and then I'll be able to see it. There he is. And then I can open up. Here's the one I had from before. And if you have a tablet, a tablet works with this program also, so double bonus, you can actually, you know, pen pressure allows you to change all that stuff. Uh, this one's lo taking an even longer time to load because I have more pieces in it. So again, you can kind of see all the detail that goes into this kind of thing. Oh, too far. Okay, so that's it. So make